Hello and welcome to episode number 30 of Celluloid Junkies. I'm joined as always by my effervescent co-host Luke Kane. How are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm good, thank you. This month we're deep in the tropics, putting pen to paper on one of the great film noirs from one of English literature's most celebrated writers. We're about to unload our six-shooter into William Wyler's 1940 film adaptation of W. Somerset Maugham's play, The Letter. I think I should tell you that there is in existence a letter. What does it mean? That's for you to say, Leslie. But I didn't write it. I swear I didn't write it. But difficult to prove that. Howard, I swear to you, I did not write this letter. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Every time I met him, I hated myself. And yet I lived for the moment when I'd see him again. You've been watching me all evening. I'm responsible for you. Because I'm so... So evil. If you love a person, you can forgive anything. It's strange that a man can live with a woman for ten years and not know the first thing about her. The year is 1911. At the British Colonial School, the Victoria Institute in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, 31-year-old acting headmaster William Proudlock is dining out with another teacher while his wife, 23-year-old Ethel, is alone in their bungalow on the school grounds. William has been working at the school for 10 years, firstly in a teaching capacity before taking over incumbent headmaster Bennett Shaw's duties when Shaw returns to England at the start of 1911. At some point in the evening, 34-year-old mine manager and engineer William Crozier Stewart visits the bungalow, telling the young boy driving his rickshaw to wait outside. The bungalow is well hidden, being about 150 metres away from the closest street, surrounded by a wide, airy veranda on all sides and a five-foot tall hedge at each edge of the property. A short while later, shots ring out, the young boy witnessing Stewart stumbling down the steps to the bungalow and collapsing lifeless on the ground. Ethel follows, emptying the remaining rounds from her revolver into Stewart's body. (laughs) Ethel protests her innocence, declaring that Stewart had come to her bungalow and tried to molest her. He tried to make love to me and I shot him. As she backed away from him, she came upon her husband's gun, picked it up and fired in self-defence. But rumours persist that Stewart was actually her lover and the prosecutor puts forward such evidence during her trial. What follows is a months-long ordeal during which Ethel Proudlock is first convicted of murder and then, following a series of petitions from husband William, the VI boys and VI staff, she is pardoned by the Sultan of Selangor. Her incarceration over, she sails off almost immediately, never to return to Malaysia. British writer W. Somerset Maugham visits Malaysia in 1921 to source material for new stories. He is already hugely successful, having written Of Human Bondage six years prior, a semi-autobiographical novel that met with critical acclaim. He stumbles upon the story of the Proudlocks, realising that it would make a fantastic play, and in 1927 translates it into fiction as The Letter. Just two years after the publication of The Letter, it is adapted for the screen for the first time as both a sound and silent picture starring Jeannie Eagles, a role for which she was under consideration for the Academy Award for Best Actress. In 1934, Morm's Of Human Bondage is filmed by Warner Brothers. Leslie Howard plays the lead opposite Betty Davis, at this time a young actress with a glamorous image that Jack Warner didn't want to destroy by putting her in such an ugly role. Despite her love for projects such as Fashions of 1934, and note the sarcasm, Davis wanted more. The rest, as they say, is history. Of Human Bondage turned Davis into a star overnight, and while the Academy failed to nominate her as Best Actress, they took note of her support and allowed write-in votes. Those votes came in in such great numbers that she ended up placing third on the night. 
The following year, Davis would win her first Oscar for Dangerous, but even she would contend that this was a consolation prize and belated recognition for her previous film. Three years later and she was back on the stage for Jezebel, her first collaboration with director and sometimes lover, William Wyler. The film, based on a 1933 play, told the story of a strong-willed young woman whose actions cost her the man she loves, and drew comparisons to Gone with the Wind despite the latter being written three years later and its film adaptation being released a year after Wyler's picture. In fact, it was Wyler himself who gave Gone with the Wind a run for its money at the Academy Awards in 1939, with his adaptation of Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights actually regarded as the best picture of the year by some, including the New York Film Critics Circle. Wyler garnered his second Best Director nomination for that film. Reportedly, following the filming of Jezebel and when Wyler and Davis were intimately involved, Wyler wrote a letter of his own, to his star, telling her that if she didn't agree to marry him by the following Wednesday, he'd marry someone else. Betty Davis left the letter unread for a week and burst into tears when she realised he was now someone else's forever. Whether this happened or not is a matter of opinion, but since we're talking about a film called The Letter, we'll just accept it as fact. The rights for The Letter are purchased by Warner Brothers from Paramount, who made the 1929 version of the film. Changes are made to the story to appease Joseph Breen and get the film past the production code censors. Betty Davis signs to the project in January 1940, and William Wyler signs on as director in April. In between, Warner contract player James Stevenson is cast as Howard Joyce, Leslie's defence attorney, first on the advice of Jack Warner and, later, against his wishes. When Warner found out that the role was meaty, he thought the film should have a more marketable start opposite Davis. George Brent, who performed alongside Davis in a whole bunch of films during the 1930s, but most notably Jezebel, The Old Maid and Dark Victory, was considered for the role of Robert Crosby but he preferred the role of Howard Joyce and so was overlooked. Herbert Marshall, who'd played Mr. Hammond in the 1929 film, was instead cast this time as Leslie's deceived husband. Finally, white actress Gail Sondergaard was cast as the Eurasian Mrs. Hammond. Sondergaard had won the Academy Award, the first Academy Award, for Best Supporting Actress in 1936, and in 1937 had starred opposite Paul Muni in the Best Picture winning The Life of Emile Zola. Shooting begins on May 27, 1940 at Warner Burbank Studios and the entire film is shot on four various sound stages around the lot. On day one, Wyler decides to tackle the film's famous first scene, an extended single take, or what looks like a single take, that lasts about two minutes. This two minute sequence was all we did on the first day, Wyler later noted, and since all of this was not in the script, we ended the day with only a quarter of the page filmed. The whole studio was in an uproar but when they saw the shot, they didn't mind. The film proceeded at a blistering pace thereafter, ending filming just three days behind schedule, but $35,000 under its $700,000 budget. This despite a run-in during filming between Wyler and Jack Warner, who was adamant that the director should be getting each shot in three or four takes. He'd seen a run sheet from one month into filming in which nine shots had taken a total of 62 takes, including one with 14 takes and another with 12. Betty Davis herself was actually pregnant during filming, although the father of the child was never divulged. As she told writer Whitney Stone for the book I'd Love to Kiss You, Conversations with Betty Davis, cinematographer Tony Gordio kept looking at me sideways. Obviously I couldn't have the baby and I was upset as hell. I had already had two abortions. I was only 32 and thought to myself that, if I married again and wanted to have a baby, my insides might be in such a mess that I couldn't. I cried and cried, but I knew what I had to do. I went to the doctor on a Saturday and showed up for scenes on Monday wearing a form-fitting white eyelet evening dress for a scene. And that damn Tony said, Jesus, Betty, it looks like you've lost five pounds over the weekend. Nevertheless, the primary filming was finished on July 19th with minor reshoots running until October. It was released less than a month later, on November 15th, 1940, touring San Francisco, Baltimore, and New York City before opening wide. Critical reception was excellent, of course, and nominations for the Academy Awards followed. The letter was given the nod for Best Picture, Director, Actress, Supporting Actor, James Stevenson in the role that Jack Warner wanted to recast, and two other awards, none of which it would end up winning.
Luke, what are your thoughts on the letter? I really love the letter. (laughs) And that's all I have to say about the film. That's it. Okay. I'll take over the rest of the episode. (laughs) Um... No, I do. I was a little late coming to the letter. I'd seen a lot of uh, Betty Davis's other films. And I remember I saw the letter because you were just banging on about how great it was. You didn't have to do a lot of convincing because I've always loved Betty Davis and I love her movies. Now, I I just think it's a standout amongst the films that she was making at this time for Warner. It actually has a really polished, really stylish quality about it that a lot of the Warner films are missing. I almost feel like it belongs more at MGM. Yeah. William Wyler came over from United Artists and Samuel Goldwyn to to direct the film. So it does have a different feel than the Warner Brothers pictures that she was doing. Yeah. Well, the Warner pictures were really kind of lean and they were hard and they were a bit rough around the edges. And uh, this film feels a lot more considered and mannered and, you know, the scenes run a little longer and um, the characters are given time to really, the the actors, sorry, are given time to really explore their characters. I think a word that's going to come up a little bit, uh, especially from me, and it's uh, going to come up when we talk about noir, is classy. And definitely the film feels classy, especially for a noir, for a crime thriller, even for a melodrama, this film feels classy. And that's probably because it's directed by William Wyler, who was a classy director. Another thing that sort of distinguishes the letter from the sort of <clears throat> domestic dramas and thrillers that Betty Davis was making is that the central murder mystery is unusual because the question is not if she did it, but why? Usually these films hinge around something we haven't seen. But in the letter, the very first thing we see is Betty Davis kill a man and he's not got a gun and he's trying to get away from her. I mean, at least from the time that that door opens of that bungalow, we know that it's not self-defense in that moment. It's become something else and that she empties her bullets. You know, are we dealing with a woman who's so locked in trauma of that moment that she just can't stop herself or is this uh, calculated? That's something that comes up in the movie as well. Howard Joyce asks her that. Why did you continue to fire? It looks like some of those shots were fired when he was already on the ground, I think is his line. Yeah, and she has a ready answer for him, like she does over and over and over again. The more and more absurd and the more things that are discovered, she's so rapid fire with her answers. And we really see how a master manipulator manages to sort of adapt in any given situation and with each new piece of information. What else is interesting is that because it's Betty Davis... And because she played vamps as often as she played heroines, we go into the movie unsure if this film's about an innocent woman being persecuted or a guilty woman evading justice. And the audience at the time must have gone in with those that that same feeling of uncertainty, uh, because it's not like this is a different actress where you would be like, oh, well, she's going to she's going to be innocent. She's going to be the heroine. Betty Davis was sort of a bit of a unknown quantity with audiences she she could play such an eclectic range of characters yeah and she also i mean as well as playing this truly evil character that she does sometimes she also did play the character who started off evil and by the end of the film was redeemed so there's a lot of different ways that this movie could go the mystery that creates the central tension of the film is the same mystery that had enraptured british colonial society in 1911 through ethel proudlock's trial Another curious thing about the film is that the mystery is solved halfway through the movie. And then the tension that holds the film together after that is whether or not this very cunning, very manipulative person is going to get away with what she's done. It's almost like a precursor to Gone Girl. That's true. Because, yeah, the tension of that film changes halfway through as well. I like that the film hinges on working out somebody's character instead of working out somebody's behaviour. I didn't write it, I swear I didn't write it. If the original is in your handwriting, it would be useless to deny it. Then it'll be a forgery. It'd be difficult to prove that. It'd be easy to prove it was genuine. It's not dated, it might have been written years ago. Oh, if you'll just give me a little time, I'll try to remember. Leslie, the prosecution could cross-examine your house, boys. They would soon find out whether someone took a letter to Hammond on the day of his death. Howard, I swear to you, I did not write this letter. I have always loved Betty Davis. She's my favourite actress. This is my favourite film of hers. It's not necessarily the best film she's ever made. In fact, I don't think it is. 
but I think that this film is kind of what you can look at and say this is what Betty Davis was doing. This was truly at her prime. You know, that nineteen late 1930s Jezebel to now Voyager and, and beyond. But that five-year period was really where Je- uh, Betty Davis commanded the most respect and had the most impact in cinemas. So it's definitely um, my favourite film. I think it's a really fun film to watch. I think it's a really classy film. It's a bit exotic that it's set in Southeast Asia. Her performance is really stunning and everything you look for when you watch a Betty Davis performance is is in this performance. I, I've always loved this movie, um, so it's a, you know, it's a pleasure to be doing it on this episode of the podcast. The letter is a film noir, uh, retrospectively it is a film noir. I don't think at the time, well nothing at the time was classified as a film noir. At the time this was a women's picture, this was a melodrama. It's come to retroactively be classified as a kind of precursor to film noir, if not a full member of the genre movement, whatever you want to call it. Because of that, it's also very different to a lot of film noirs. It's different to Sunset Boulevard, for instance, that we looked at last month. Until the movement started in the 1970s to classify relevant films from the period, and that period stretched from, say, 1941, and a lot of people consider The Maltese Falcon to be the first film noir. And it's not until there was this retrospective recategorising that the idea of film noir genre started. And that's why there's such a different reading of that period depending on who you speak to. Some consider noir a genre, others say it's a movement or a period, and still others say it's simply a style. Paul Schrader, who's um, obviously one of our favourite directors and who we looked at previously on this podcast, he wrote a thesis on noir in 1972, and he says that the letter was part of the wartime period, defined by classy directors, studio sets, and more talk than action, which it definitely is. It's also different in the structure. Double Indemnity, Laura, Out of the Past, Sunset Boulevard, they all used flashbacks. Often, those films would begin in the present, They would go to an extended flashback and then they would return to the conclusion in the present, at which time the non-linear narrative had caught up with the linear narrative. A single character would begin literally telling the narrative to the screen, but then the film would dissolve into an objective point of view without voiceover, or it would have voiceover backing up the visuals. So these were not unreliable narrators. You know, these things, you're seeing what actually happened. The difference is that in the letter there are no flashbacks and that makes Leslie Crosby an unreliable narrator. At its core she's stating mistruths to other characters and that's where the film's deceit comes from. Yeah, the letter definitely has a bit of a bedroom chamber feeling about it because it's basically just conversations between various characters in different rooms. Apart from the opening scene, which is all action and totally mesmerising, what we get after that is, is basically discussions around that first scene which I think is why Wyler had to make that scene impressive and stand out. In terms of melodrama and noir, there is, in terms of subject matter, an overlap between those two genres. They both deal with similar themes. Melodrama comes from the Greek word melos, which means song. And you know that because you are Greek. (laughs) And the French word drame, which means drama, because the original melodramas of the 1800s were plays that were musicals. And uh, melodramas deal with extreme themes designed to elicit heightened emotional responses from the viewer. Melodramas would hit their apex in American cinema in the 50s with the Douglas Sirk films. And the term was often used derogatorily to describe women's pictures or pictures with overblown devices that easily are going to hold an audience's attention. It's almost as if there was this unexpressed belief at the time that the only way an audience could be interested in a story about a woman was if the dramatic tension was blown up. In the letter we have a female-centred story about adultery, revenge, murder and blackmail and they're staples of melodrama but they're blended into a noir point of view which is bleak and nihilistic. This is a bit of a precursor to noir. It, It predates noir by a year or two. And we've spoken at length about noir. We know that it was born in France, it was adopted by post-war Hollywood in the 40s, and they were largely crime stories with cynical, pessimistic undertones, with an aesthetic emphasis on the interplay of light and shadow. It isn't actually an altogether easy fusion, because traditional melodramas are sentimental and impassioned, whereas noir point of view is violent and hard-edged. So what we get with the letter is this weird hybrid 
of melodrama and noir with these splashes of oriental mysticism thrown into it. And I think that's what makes the film quite unique. And when you're watching it, you're thinking, I can't really say that this film is typical of the films of the 40s that I've seen. But um, Mildred Pierce is another film that blends melodrama and noir. And that came out a few years later, once noir had become a recognisable style to American audiences. Can I just tell you um, my favourite noir moment in the letter? Oh, yeah. You know when Leslie, after she sat down and served tea in this very civilised arrest, she goes out to the porch to get into the cop car to be taken to the station, and she stops and, like, sees the, you know, part where the body's fallen, and she's sort of stricken by it. And then we don't see her come down the steps. All we see is her shadow pass over where the body was. Mm. And it looks like this Grim Reaper is coming over this scene of this murder. I think that's just brilliant. Oh, Leslie. Yes? There's just one question I'd like to ask you. Yes, what is it? When I was looking at Hammond's body... Oh, I'm sorry, my dear, but this is a question that's bound to come up. Yes, Howard, what is it? It seemed to me that some of the shots must have been fired after he was lying on the ground. Oh, I know it must sound terribly cold-blooded. But I was so terrified. Everything was confused and blurred. I didn't know what I was doing. Of course, my dear. I shouldn't have brought it up tonight. Put it out of your mind. James Stevenson as Howard Joyce is not a typical noir male. He's not hard-boiled, disillusioned, socially estranged, alienated. In fact, he's respectable. His entire arc centres around being so hesitant to take this illegal action to help a friend... I mean, in his personal life, he supports a seemingly loving family and works in a professional job that he is successful at. I mean, an even more defining noir feature would be if there was a romantic involvement between this male lead, James Stevenson, and the female lead, Betty Davis, which there's not. And there's no effort to infer that there is. So he's not corrupted on sexual grounds by the femme fatale, which is such a staple of noir films. That's probably the biggest thing that's missing from this movie. Oh, Betty Davis only loves one man in this movie. Likewise, there's no hero. I think Howard Joyce would probably come as close to an active hero. Robert Crosby would probably be um, the person that you feel the most sympathy for. But even Joyce takes this illegal action and puts his career on the line to help her. Uh, and Robert is just a sap. I mean, you feel sorry for him, but you also feel that he's a little bit pathetic at times. So there's nobody to really engage with in this truth-seeking mission. Everyone kind of has their flaws. Some of them, obviously, are irredeemable. You've been watching me all evening. I'm responsible for you to the court. No, that isn't it. You've been... what? Trying to read my thoughts. I'm trying to understand you. Why? Because I'm so... so evil. That's it, isn't it? Obviously, as Leslie Crosby, she kind of continually twists the truth and and men act on her lies. And, And this would be something that would come to define her roles for years. Um, she's both the femme fatale while also portraying herself as uh, this fiercely powerful and independent woman. And it's not particularly new territory for Betty Davis. There's that scene where Betty Davis goes to pay the money to get the letter from the, the widow and she's all draped in white and she's wearing the white veil and she kind of looks like the Virgin Mary. The colours that the people wear in the letter are, I mean, they're very well thought out. Betty Davis in the opening scene is wearing a dark dress. So when she retreats back into the house and she begins spinning her web of lies, she's changed into a white blouse so that the the men can see her as a more pure victim. And we know from the poster art that that dark dress is actually red, which of course is the colour of passion and fire. I, I know it's not tied, but that harks back to Jezebel. In Jezebel, instead of wearing a white dress to a ball... She wears a red dress because her husband's been ignoring her. So she does it kind of to spite him and she ends up losing him. That's the story of Jezebel. But the other thing is that the men in the letter always wear white. They're always in white suits. That's not something that you would usually see. But then by the end of the movie, when Betty Davis is accepting her fate, she's back in her dark dress. 
So the the colours that people are wearing in this movie is very well thought out and does definitely play a part in the narrative. Later, Betty Davis would continue to play bitches or vamps. You know, obviously we get, you know, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and Dead Ringer and The Anniversary and those sorts of films. But in the letter and in her earlier films, she was using her feminine wiles as part of how she got away with it. Whereas in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane... She's a total grotesque. Roger Ebert wrote a really interesting essay about Betty Davis, and he called it Cinematic Medusa. And I think that tells us a lot about her brand. The thing that truly is remarkable about Betty Davis in this film is that it requires her to think convincingly on camera. And that sounds really simple, but it isn't. And very few actors actually do it really well. It it tends to be something that's overacted. And Betty Davis, you can actually see new ideas lighting on her face as she goes. And for me, her best scene in this film easily is that eight minute scene that she has with the lawyer when she first discovers that the letter exists. I did write that letter, but I was afraid to mention it. You see, I thought none of you would believe me if if I admitted that he'd come there at my invitation. I dare say it was terribly silly of me, but... But you see, once that I said I'd had no communication with Hammond, I was forced to stick to it. Then you'll be called upon to explain why you asked him to come to see you when Robert was away. Well, I'll tell you why, Howard. You see, I was planning a surprise for Robert's birthday, and I'd heard he wanted a new gun, and... Oh, well, I'm so dreadfully stupid about sporting things, and... Well, I thought I'd talk to Jeff about it and ask him to order one for me. Perhaps you've forgotten what's in the letter. you read it again no i don't want to yeah that that scene is one example and the other example of her thinking on camera is when her and howard are in the room with robert and she finally tells him the truth about what was in the letter and yeah i i know what you mean she's just in the background there and and she commands this scene even though it's really about him can we talk a little bit about the scene in the letter where betty davis tells her story because i was listening to a podcast as part of this research on the letter and the two podcasters said that the way she tells her story is really aloof and indifferent like she doesn't really care and i thought did we watch the same movie because i thought that the way that she tells her story is extremely modulated and that there's a lot of emotion in it and she looks genuinely traumatized and upset about what has happened yeah aloof doesn't seem like the right word to me either he lifted me in his arms and started carrying me somehow he stumbled on those steps we fell and i got away from him suddenly i remembered robert's revolver in the drawer of that chest he got up and ran after me but i reached it before he could catch me i seized the gun as he came toward me i heard a report and saw him lurch toward the door it was all instinctive i didn't even know i'd fired Then I followed him out to the veranda. He staggered across the porch, grabbed the railing, but it slipped through his hand and he fell down the steps. I don't remember anything more, just the reports one after another, till there was a funny little click and the revolver was empty. It was only then I knew what I'd done. When you first watch the opening scene, she seems sufficiently disturbed by what's happened that her story could be true. I don't think that the question of her guilt arises because she's having a weirdly indifferent reaction to what's happened to her. She seems like somebody who's been through something. Yeah, look, I'm glad that you brought that up because I have seen this movie enough times to know exactly what's happening in this movie. So I guess I no longer look at the start of it as, you know, Betty Davis could be innocent. I know she's not. Whereas when we were talking the other day, you said that you hadn't seen it in some time and you were wondering where it was going to go. I knew she was guilty, (laughs) but I didn't remember why or exactly in what way she was guilty. I love how when she first gives her story, she apologizes to her husband for being overwhelmed and she thanks the police for being so patient. And later we will see she's charmed her jailer who thinks she's beautiful and shouldn't be there. And when she does start telling that story, we do sense that it's a performance and, you know, she's laid out on the couch and she's got all the men around her and her husband's holding her hand. And we realize that she's contrived the scene, you know, she's sent for all the players, they've all gathered to her house and now she's ready to give her monologue. 
And not only that, but she was the one who dictated when she would make her appearance and how it would be. You know, she makes a grand yes. entrance. And her stories verify, can be verified in several ways because Hammond did park a quarter of a mile down the road, um, which suggests that his intentions were sinister. And Robert confirms that he left a revolver loaded in the chest um, on nights when he's working late for her protection. She's very clever in how she's included these facts that she has no control over to give credulity to what she's saying. That's right. And at this point, we don't know about the existence of the letter and we don't know how contrived that scene is. And then in the scene where her lawyer Howard does tell her that there is an existence, this letter, I love that that scene ends with... Howard telling her essentially that he now believes she's guilty and as he says that the camera closes in on Betty Davis essentially cutting him out of the frame at the same time that he is withdrawing his trust and his support of Leslie. Why do you think that uh, Leslie Crosby was uh, trusted that her word was taken? Because she has an air of respectability that's definitely it, isn't it? And that's set up in the in, in the opening scene, which we'll get to a little bit later as well. I think the nation, her nationality in this Southeast Asian country elevates her above the natives in kind of importance. These people, they owned the plantations that, that gave these native workers employment. They, they brought industry to the country and allowed them to, to thrive and make money. Pauline Kale called the whole film a, a study in sexual hypocrisy. Betty Davis is very, very respectable. You know, she serves cups of tea. She's white. There's already a a political divide that has separated people into camps. There's the natives and they look after their own and then the white supremacists and they look after their own. That in a way is protection for her because if they're not to believe her, then it creates divide inside their own camp. And that's what happened seemingly in the Proud Lot case as well. Are we going to believe that this is a woman who could be so sexually obsessed with somebody in an adulterous situation that she would commit this barbaric act? It doesn't square at all with the Leslie that's on display. And I think what makes Leslie truly despicable isn't that she's committed the murder, but her own arrogance. She thinks she can reduce the men around her into tools who will guilelessly help her get away with it. Yeah, and for a while, it works. To me, the most chilling moment in the film is when Leslie confesses the affair and Howard says, he's going to forgive you. And she says, in a very assured way, yeah, he's going to forgive me. And you wonder for, for one horrible moment if it was all part of her plan to tell him. Because they must have known that eventually the husband was going to wonder where his $10,000 went. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and this isn't somebody who only thinks a step ahead. She lives life like she's playing chess and she's always five steps ahead. And so she must have known, yeah, I'll confess. And yes, he'll forgive me and life will go on. He told me he was sick and tired of me, that it was true about that other woman, that she was the only one that had ever meant anything to him, that he was glad that I knew because now I'd leave him alone. But he got up to go and I knew if he left, I'd never see him again. So I seized the revolver and fired heard a cry and I knew I'd fit it. He staggered toward the veranda and I ran after him and fired and fired and fired. There's no excuse for me. Don't deserve to live. I'm sorry. going to forgive you. Yes. He's going to forgive me. The lace work is something that Leslie's working on from the very first scene to the and it's the very last shot of the movie. And Howard when he sees it points out that it must take enormous patience and concentration to do. And it starts off as this small piece of cloth and it slowly becomes bigger and more intricate as Leslie's lies become bigger and more intricate. 
It's not a complicated or subtle metaphor, but it's one that works simply and believably within the confines of the narrative. And the final shot of her lace work hanging off an armchair and billowing in the breeze, which, you know, now the lace work has finished because Leslie is dead. As she walks to her death, yeah. I think that that's a really, really lovely inclusion in the film and very, very smart storytelling. I'm sure a lot of this was present in Somerset Maugham's uh, story as well. But then William Wyler is the one that turns it into this visual narrative. He directed more Academy Award actor and actress nominees and winners than any other director. So he directed 36 acting nominations. Uh, the next closest was Elia Kazan with 24. He directed 14 winners. And the next closest was Elia Kazan with nine. Uh, he won the Best Director Award three times himself from a record, still a record, 12 nominations. Until 2015, he had the uh, record for the most overall Academy Award nominations for his films with 127. Uh, in 2015, he was overtaken by Steven Spielberg. His resume is, to put it mildly, just outstanding. From 1936 to 42, one of his films was nominated for Best Picture every single year. And that period includes the letter. Uh, after this streak ended, he made 16 more films, six of which were also nominated for that award. He even won the Palme d'Or at Cannes. So some of the films he directed, obviously Wuthering Heights we mentioned with Laurence Olivier in 1939. Uh, Mrs. Miniver in 1942, Best Picture, Best Director. Best Years of Our Lives in 1946, Best Picture, Best Director. The Heiress in 1949, Roman Holiday, The Desperate Hours, Friendly Persuasion with Gary Cooper in 1956 is what won the Palme d'Or. Ben Hur in 1959, The Children's Hour, which was a remake of a, or another adaptation of a Lillian Hellman play that he had directed in 1936 called These Three, How to Steal a Million, and Funny Girl. Anyway, that was 11 films, but I couldn't drop any of them. There were a bunch I didn't mention. This director is like a gay man's dream. <laughs> I've seen so many of those films, and, and not because I was seeking out Wyler movies, but because, you know, I was obsessed with Audrey Hepburn or Barbara Streisand or Betty, Betty Davis, Davis or Olivia, Olivia de, de Havilland. <laughs> All know. of these gay, gay <laughs> iconographic female actresses that we just adore yeah. uh, biologically. <laughs> I think he is similar to Kubrick in that he was somebody who really strove for quality more so than most of his contemporaries, even the great ones like Billy Wilder and Michael Curtiz and uh, Elia Kazan. I think Wyler really, really pushed and pushed and drove everybody to exhaustion. And that's why when you watch the films, all of the scenes are so cared for and detailed. Jan Herman, she wrote a biography of William Wyler called A Talent for Trouble. And she said his pictures not only resonate with poetry and humor, they offer psychological maturity and sophisticated treatment of character, more typical of literature than movies. And I think he typically worked from a, a, a source of literature as well. And there's, there's, you know, we see a lot of these choices in, in the letter. There are three that I think are particularly wonderful. When Betty Davis or when Leslie is telling her story for the first time, we get this really unexpected shot. And I can only think of describing it as a retrospective POV shot where as Leslie is recounting her story, the camera glides through and gives us a visual narration of what she's talking about. So we see the staircase where she says that Hammond stumbled and then the camera veers up to the chest of drawers on the right when she's talking about remembering the revolver. And then it kind of pans left out the door, down the stairs to the spot where Hammond ultimately died. That camera movement harks back to the start of the film and that opening sequence, which is all about camera movement. And there's so much fluid camera movement in that opening scene. Another really mature choice that Wyler makes is that he doesn't really give us any close-ups of Hammond's body. And even though characters return to it several times, we don't see it. We all know what a dead body looks like in the 1940s, a male dead body, which mostly they only showed men dead because I guess it was considered indecent to show a woman dead. They're always wearing suits. They've always got a kind of a glazed frozen face that looks a little bit put on. And then there's like bullet holes maybe in some scuffed fabric to show that they've been shot, but usually no blood. The inauthenticity would often take you out of it or remind you that it was a fantasy, remind you that it was make-believe. And the fact that Wyler doesn't give us this shot makes Leslie's crime more real and more heinous. The other choice I really admire 
is that when Mrs. Crosby turns up, she's allowed to speak Cantonese rather than English, and there aren't subtitles, which dignifies the character. Hollywood didn't often allow Oriental people to be dignified. It wasn't until, I think it was Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch in about 1968 that they started showing. I think that was the first Hollywood production that showed what's called exit wounds. Um, So where a bullet comes out of a body and, and that's where I guess the majority of an impact comes from in terms of blood or marks on the body. So you're right, it it did look, until that point, I mean, a gunshot just looked like a black dot on somebody's body. And it did look unrealistic, didn't it? Yeah, they, they were silly. The film wanted to show you somebody died, and so they did it in a way that would satisfy the production code with the limited special effects and the limited techniques that they had at that time. There is a shot of the body, but from it, it's very quick. From then on, you know, they move him to the rubber drying room and you don't see him in those subsequent shots where the body is referenced and there, there's a character looking at him. So it's, um, it's really a very conscious choice on Wyler's behalf. William Wyler, he doesn't come to mind as immediately as some of the other great directors of the time. His films, they spanned a huge number of genres And while undeniably great, they were these largely big, glossy Hollywood productions that lacked a cohesive theme. So while the director himself was saleable, possibly his filmography was not marketable as a whole, which detracts in today's times. I mean, it would be difficult to put together a William Wyler box set, for instance, wherein all of the films would appeal to a single buyer. Somebody who enjoys Ben-Hur, they might like The Best Years of Our Lives, but they probably won't care for Funny Girl. Somebody who loves the letter won't necessarily love the big country, but they may really like Roman Holiday or How to Steal a Million, or they may not. So I think based on a single theme, Wyler is harder to categorise. Yeah, he was eclectic. And I mean, the whole idea of the autorist theory is that there are these directors who have certain things they want to say, and that these messages recur again and again in their movies. Uh, Wyler, you couldn't really say that. I mean, what does Funny Girl have in common with The Collector? Yeah. It's sort of like Spielberg. Like, you know, people don't bang on about how great Spielberg is. It's kind of accepted that Spielberg is great and that some of his movies are iconographic and will live forever and we don't do a lot of analysis of Spielberg. The other thing about William Wyler is that maybe there wasn't a lot of hidden messages, maybe not a lot of subtext. I mean, that's funny to say, though, because there was a lot of subtext in the letter. Go on. Well, I mean, look, just all of those motifs and these recurring themes that we've talked about. I mean, that's very similar to something like Citizen Kane. I'll rephrase it and say not a lot of personal subtext. I think he just loved telling stories and he would tell any story in the best way that he could. Mm. But in the subtext, you wouldn't find commonalities that go back to Wyler's own personal sensibilities. You know, I'm far less likely to pay attention to, you know, a John Ford movie than I am a William Wyler movie, um, simply because I'm not really too interested or have never typically been too interested in the genres in which John Ford works. But William Wyler, like Steven Spielberg, and I think you're right when you say that he's a an apt comparison, I think he is the most apt comparison, especially recently, there's always going to be something that I can access from that filmography that I'm going to enjoy. Yeah. I mean, you look at Hitchcock's films and, you know... You... There are a thousand examples across dozens of them of paranoia or of maybe sexual anxiety. And those are the sorts of things that we connotate with Hitchcock. But you don't have those same recurring themes coming up again and again in Wyler's work. I think I think what's especially remarkable about someone like Hitchcock is that he can make, and let's just take a three-year period, Vertigo, North by Northwest and Psycho, he can make three films that appeal to the same audience that are so markedly different from one another. Let's face it, there's very few directors who can do that. Yeah, and maybe that is a little bit of an overrated quality of a director. I mean, do you really want a director that's going to discuss the same thematic content over and over again? Oh, no, I think you're right. I think Hitchcock is entirely um, overrated. No, you're just a horrible director. We'll, <laughs> I'm we'll not talk saying... About, we'll talk I'm about that on a that. future episode, Luke. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> the matter upon which I desire to speak to you, sir, is very delicate mm. and confidential. Well, what matter is it? It has to do with the case of the Crown versus Crosby. Yes? 
a circumstance has come to my attention, sir, which seems to me to put a different complexion on the case. So many changes were made to this story by the Hayes Code or the production code. There's uh, two major changes to the story. Before Warner completed the deal to purchase the rights to the story from Paramount, he actually wrote to Chief Censor Joseph Breen, who said that the story in its current state suffered from miscegenation, uh, which is uh, relations between uh, different races, adultery without compensating moral values, and unpunished acts of murder. So the first change that Kosh and Weiler made was to marry Hammond off, which meant he was no longer engaging in an illicit, unmarried relationship. They also altered what was his mistress, now his wife, from Chinese to Eurasian, half Asian, half European, which subdued the miscegenation, uh, which was expressly forbidden by the code. Personally, I mean, I'm not sure that those particular changes have any kind of negative impact on the film. I think it adds to the weight of Hammond's convictions in no longer engaging in a sexual relationship with Leslie that he has fallen in love and been married and had so far refused to tell her. So I think in story terms, those changes actually work. I mean, do you think that change has much of an impact on the movie? It had an impact on me because I thought I was getting a Chinese woman. I was duped. (laughs) I mean, they've really made... Uh, Gail Sondergaard up to look. I mean, Betty Davis's description of her is quite apt, isn't it? And once, quite by chance, I actually saw her. Oh? You never mentioned that? What was she like? Horrible. She was all covered with gold chains and bracelets and spangles. Her face like a mask. Leslie's description of her is pretty much how Hollywood felt about Asian people. Yeah. And of course, as soon as Leslie says that, we know who she's talking about because that's exactly how she looks at the beginning of the film. In terms of costuming and um, presentation, it is a racist caricature of an of a Eurasian person. Mm. And even the very beginning of the film where they're all lying in their hammocks and playing their oriental music, the otherness hits you in the face. Yes. Obviously, it's a shame that a Caucasian actress was cast... It should have been an Asian actress. Weiler did say about that, that today you would take a Chinese actress, but there weren't any. Anna Mae Wong was the only Oriental actress I could have used, and she was kind of a sex kitten and too young. That's interesting. I didn't know that he'd even referenced it. It's interesting to hear. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he was aware of it, and certainly looking back later at it, he was aware of it. In terms of a racist point of view, I think it only extends as far as costuming, sometimes a little bit in the visual arrangement, but how the characters are written and in the narrative, I don't think of the film as particularly racist. If anything, I think it has, it kind of frowns upon the white supremacist group and is rooting for the natives. Yeah, that's right. I think even on... Ong Sen is an interesting character who drives the narrative a little bit by uh, putting forward this proposition that the letter is in play. Yeah, he's fantastic. I find him so creepy. I think he's a great agitator. You know, he's he, his scheming is so well-mannered. He's the wrong nationality and the wrong colour, but he's smart and ambitious. He got a job as a clerk in a law office. We spoke a couple of days ago about that moment in the film where he arranges, he's arranging the meeting between Howard and uh, Mrs. Hammond. Ong Chi Seng. Yes, sir. What are you getting out of this? Two thousand dollars. And the great satisfaction of being of service to you and our client. And after this exchange, we see Howard drive away in this really kind of fancy car. And moments later, Ong pulls away in this cheap, loud buggy that looks like it's about to fall apart. He's doing something that's ethically wrong but he's not he's not trying to hide that fact he's you know he's totally upfront with everybody about it and he's very polite about it like painfully polite and what we see with Ong and Mrs. Hammond are people that are playing the white game for their own ends you know ultimately they want to get Leslie off so that she can face their justice system definitely it's something that that I mean if anything the, the white character of um, especially Leslie is using her race to her advantage. That's the second major change to the film. Certainly the biggest change was to the ending, and that's something that's new to this version of the movie. In the story, the subsequent plays in the first film, Leslie is acquitted, but her punishment is that she's killed the man that she really loved and will now live in a marriage in which she's unhappy. There's no further retribution because that's enough. 
while as later that's not what happens so leslie tells robert the truth of course and then instead of saying in that marriage or divorcing which was both frowned upon and also somewhat forbidden by the hayes code not that it would have been shown in the film she confronts her fate she knows that mrs hammond is waiting outside waiting to kill her she walks out to meet her demise under the same moonlight as we will look at under which mr hammond met his It works for me in some ways, but it's also an imposition as it's a little bit fantastic, which the film hasn't really been to this point, maybe a little far-fetched. But I think the big problem with this comes following the murder of Leslie, and we see Mrs. Hammond and the head boy then walk away from the house and get caught by a roaming police officer who hasn't even witnessed the murder we must say he was around the corner from the wall so now mrs hammond who was avenging her husband's death and punishing the murder as per the hayes code has to herself be punished because of the hayes code well wyler himself said about that moment which is a such a stupid moment in an otherwise really smart movie you couldn't leave anyone unpunished even the eurasian widow somehow had to be punished We had to put in two cops to apprehend her. That was silly, but we had to do it. I wish when they show the letter on television that they would cut off the ending where she is arrested. I think if you leave it with the murder of Leslie, then I think that makes great sense. So let's go back to the first sequence of the letter. The film starts with the Warner Brothers logo. It comes up and it's followed by a series of title screens, the first of which is Betty Davis. It's against this moonlit sky with the silhouette of a palm tree. We then get the film title card and credits for Morm and Wyler against this same background. As we introduce the rest of the cast, the background changes to a shot of the Crosby Bungalow or what we think of the, is the Crosby Bungalow. And then a couple of different tropical themed shots are used for the crew. After a fade to black, we fade back into a shot of the moon. So that's really the first shot of the movie. There's a few clouds around, but the moon is seen in its entirety. Everything is nice and bright. We dissolve to a sign that sets the location. Rubberco, Singapore, plantation number one. So we know exactly where we are. We then dissolve in the opposite direction to a close-up shot of a tree, panning down as we see that the tree has been cut open in several spots to allow sap to drip down and collect into a bucket. We hear the dripping of this sap as Max Steiner's gentle Asian-themed score begins playing. We pan to the right, and there's a number of other buckets sitting on the ground waiting to be filled up. We continue to pan to the right and we see a bungalow in the background. As we move, the sleeping area of the native workers is seen. A bamboo hut with a thatched roof that houses workers sleeping in hammocks. There are, by my count, at least 21 workers in there. We continue to pan and are met with a dissolve against a black background which hides the transition quite well. We begin to see the bungalow in all its glory. This is the home of Robert and Leslie Crosby and juxtaposed against the workers sleeping area it immediately shows the difference in fortune and import between the natives and the Europeans. The focus changes slightly from the bungalow in the background to a bird in the foreground sitting on the bamboo fence. And then we hear the first gunshot, which sends the bird flying away. As the camera comes to a halt, a man exits through the bungalow's front door, a woman following closely behind. She fires again, and we cut to two sleeping dogs who are startled awake, followed by the same reaction from the sleeping workers. The dogs begin to bark. We cut back to the two people coming out of the bungalow in a close shot, and they are Hammond and Leslie Crosby. She fires again and he falls down. The shot pans right as it plays out in a much quicker, more frenzied movement than the left to right pans that preceded it. Leslie unloads her last three shots, and the camera comes to a halt with her in the centre of the frame. She is staring down at the body, but the body is not in the shot. The sounds of barking dogs and workers talking is heard loudly now. Leslie's arm lowers as we dolly toward her, and she drops the gun as we go in for a tight close-up shot of her expressionless face. And that's when the light begins to get dark. The natives are now watching what is unfolding. The head boy looks up to the sky as the moon is covered by clouds, the silhouetted tree now blowing in what has become a strong wind. 
We cut back to his face and it is now shot in almost total darkness as the moon's brightness has been extinguished. Finally, we cut back to Leslie. She is in darkness, framed in a mid-shot. We cut to an over-the-shoulder shot of her and finally see the corpse of Hammond lying on the ground. Gradually the shot gets brighter and Davis looks surprised over her shoulder and back past the camera. We cut to the sky once more and the moon is coming out from behind the cloud cover. We cut once more back to Davis as she again looks at the body before beginning to retreat into the bungalow as the head boy of the plantation runs to the scene. The head boy checks the body, determines it's Mr. Hammond, looks down at the gun and is summoned inside by Leslie. He pointedly walks around the body while still looking at it, out of shot, as he goes inside. So that's the opening sequence of the letter. And it's visually stunning. Obviously, we say at the start of this podcast, you know, if you haven't seen the film, you should watch the movie and then come back to the podcast. But it's especially important if you haven't seen this shot, this scene, um, go on YouTube and search for the letter opening and you'll find it. There's a full full HD um, version of most of that scene on YouTube. So so have a look at that. But the themes, the motifs, the the everything introduced just in this three minute scene there are many many things that are replicated throughout the movie time and time and time again the moon determines the lighting of the scene when it's bright at the start of the scene the feeling is that everything is tranquil in this tropical paradise as the murder occurs and then the moon disappears behind the clouds the scene gets darker and indicates that something sinister is occurring when the moon reappears It's not to say everything is all right, but rather it passes judgment on Leslie. It now frames her as the purveyor of this deed, shining this intense light upon her and forcing her to look upon what she has done without the cover of darkness as protection. And I just quickly want to say that single shot of Leslie looking over her shoulder as the moon comes out again is one of the strongest shots in the entire movie. Yeah, the first scene sets up the moon as an accusing eye. That's a good description of it. I love that. Yeah, even William Koch said that when the moonlight hits Leslie in that moment, it's as if it's casting prison stripes on her dress. Donato Tataro wrote for Off Screen magazine when they looked at the openings of some famous film noirs. It relies heavily on intuition and retroactive thinking. I I believe personally, this kind of opening is definitely made for keen-eyed viewers who enjoy viewing film as literature. Why don't you tell us about the release and reception of the film? Well, it opened at The Strand in Manhattan on November 22nd, 1940. The poster art of a self-possessed Betty Davis in a scarlet dress holding a smoking revolver tantalised audiences with a tagline that read, With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. The film grossed $3.5 million domestically, the equivalent of $112 million today. It was the ninth highest grossing film of 1940, ahead of Davis's other film release that year, All This in Heaven 2, which ranked 12th, and was also nominated for Best Picture, so you can see how popular Betty Davis was at, at that time. Bosley Crowther of the New York Times gushed about the film, he complimented Wyler's stylish direction and Davis's performance, but lamented the feeble ending imposed upon Wyler by the Hayes office. Of the film, he wrote, It is an evil tale plotted with an eye to its torturing effect. With infinite care, Wyler has created the dark, humid atmosphere of the rubber country. At a slow, inexorable pace, he has accumulated the details. His camera generally speaks more eloquently than anyone in the picture. The tensile strength of Mr. Wyler's suspension is incredible. Time magazine was no less effusive. Wyler has packed this picture with atmosphere. He keeps the audience strained with a most effective dramatic time bomb, the constant feeling that something very bad is about to occur. The Hollywood Reporter touted it as one of the best films of the year, writing Betty Davis has to divide honours of this great triumph with first William Wyler, the director, and secondly Max Steiner for his most interpretive music. So funny, uh, I heard a lot of compliments about Steiner's music and I thought it was just pretty generic. I think it's one of the weaker elements of the film, but anyway. The film was nominated for seven Academy Awards, as you've said. It lost in all categories, but it was up against some stiff competition that year. Rebecca, The Great Dictator, The Grapes of Wrath, The Philadelphia Story. I mean, they're all regarded as classics these days. Despite having made dozens of films, James Stevenson was still relatively unknown when the letter was released and his muted performance. 
As a morally anguished lawyer brought him newfound recognition, unfortunately his career ascension was abruptly cut short when he suffered a major heart attack and died five months later at the age of 52. As for Davis, the film launched a streak of highly successful films throughout the early 40s that would prove the most fertile period of her career. As for Wyler, he continued to make commercial films for 30 years. Morn's play has inspired several remakes. One came just seven years later and was renamed The Unfaithful, starring Anne Sheridan. A TV movie was made in 1982 with Lee Remick, and in 2009, the Santa Fe Opera premiered what it referred to as the first noir opera. But it's Wyler's version that remains the gold standard adaptation of Morn's work. Leslie, tell me, now, this minute, do you love me? Yes, I do. No, I can't, I can't, I can't! Leslie, what is it? Leslie, what is it? With all my heart, I still love the man I killed! Let's do the quiz. Alright. You go first. Okay. Lee Remick made a TV version of The Letter in 1982, as I said. She appeared in a stage version of another movie we've covered on this podcast. Which one was it? Sunset Boulevard. No, Wait Until Dark. Wait, I, I knew that as well, because I did have a question about Lee Remick in here. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember reading that. Which Warner Brothers contracted director was initially considered for the letter after directing Davis in two films in 1939? Ooh. I don't know. I'm going to say George Cukor. It was Edmund Goulding who directed Dark Victory and the Old Maid, and he would also direct her again in The Great Lie in 1941 and Old Acquaintance in 1943. But apparently Jack Warner found his ideas for the letter a trifle radical. Maybe he wanted to turn the Asians into human beings and Jack Warner was like, (laughs) slow down, mate, we aren't there yet. (laughs) Um, Which Betty Davis film was Tony Gordio, the cinematographer, on the following year? The Great Lie. Did you just look that up? No, I just looked to remember the name of the movie that she made the Well, then you really shouldn't get that point. That's cheating. It was The Great Lie. I just said it. Okay, you get one point, whatever. Which crew role did William Wyler want to fill with an Academy Award winning regular collaborator with whom he'd worked on United Artists produced films such as Wuthering Heights, Dead End and These Three? Oh, I don't know. Just to have a guess at a role that William Wyler wanted to bring over from United Artists to shoot. Screenwriter. No. In fact, he he did that. He brought over Howard Kosh. It was cinematography. So he'd worked on those films with Greg Toland, but Jack Warner wanted to stick with Tony Gordio, who Davis liked. Which cast member called Gail Sondergaard's performance as Hammond's widow breathtakingly sinister? Which cast member? Betty Davis. Yes. Prior to the production of the 1982 ABC TV version of The Letter, starring Lee Remick, lead actress Lee Remick said, Our version is different because... Your questions are so hard. Why is that version different? Our version is different because we're doing it with an Asian mistress and not a Eurasian wife. She said, Our version is different because we actually show what happened rather than relying on the woman's explanation. Oh, that is different. I guess that would make Leslie guilty from the first frame rather than from halfway through. Be interesting to see, and I believe that TV version of the film actually got quite good reviews. I think it won a Golden Globe. Okay, this is my third and final question. Um, Wyler shot 33 takes of the opening scene, which took an entire day. Which was the one used in the film? Which take? Oh, that's really interesting. I don't know. Um, I'm going to go number four. The first. Oh, really? (laughs) Interesting. That was actually your fourth question. Was it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. Okay. Well, I've already lost this quiz, so... Well, I'll ask you another one anyway. All right. So one of Wyler's films was nominated for five acting Academy Awards in a single year. The second highest number for any movie. Which film was it? Mm, I have no idea. Ben-Hur? No, it was Mrs. Miniver from 1942. I've never seen that. No, I've never seen it either. It's got a good reputation. I should check it out. How many Oscars was composer Max Steiner nominated for over his career? 13. 24. Wow. Yeah. Was he nominated for the letter? Uh, yeah. 
Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached your verdict? We have. Do you find the prisoner at the bar, Leslie Crosby, guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Well, what do you rate the letter? I give it 4.5. I shave off 0.5 only because I really, really, really hate that ending. Mm -hmm. Comparing it to something like Mildred Pierce, I just feel like even though the letter's great, it's great as a genre mystery and genre thriller, but I, I don't know that the film speaks larger than that. I give it four and a half stars as well. I don't think the letter is perfect, the tacked on ending especially, but it's a film that I enjoy greatly. It's got great symbolism and power. Uh, it's got a performance that I adore by Davis in a role that really defines her. And so I find it a lot of fun. I actually have so much fun watching this movie. I find it really enjoyable. It's my favourite Betty Davis film to rewatch, but it's not the best Betty Davis film. Well, thank you to all of our listeners for uh, letting us rabbit on about the letter. I hope that you, if you haven't seen it, that you'll go out and check it out. Um, it might not be something that you typically watch. Then again, it might be. You might have seen it a thousand times. You might watch it every Christmas with mum and dad. What the hell do I know? Uh, next month, we are going to get together to talk about Hal Ashby's 1971 dark comedy drama, Harold and Maud. Wow, that's really exciting. I don't, do you like that movie? Yeah, no, I do love Harold and Maud, and I've got it on Blu-ray, but I haven't watched it in such a long time. Such a long time. It have to be going back a decade since I've watched Harold and Maud. Do you know that I had so much trouble picking a movie this month? I don't know why. And then I was listening to Hysteria Continues. They were doing a segment on their favourite non-horror movies. And Nathan said that his number one favourite non-horror movie was Harold and Maud. And the minute that he said it, I thought, ah, oh, I'm going to cover that on the show. That's the next movie I want to do. Alrighty, well, that's us for this month of Celluloid Junkies. We're going to try and release episodes a little bit more frequently because we've been pretty slack. I mean, I think we've been doing this show for a couple of years and we've only got 30 episodes. So we want to try and build up our collection a little bit more. And also, um, I think I speak for both of us when I say that we're really loving it. We're loving doing the show right now. Um, it's gotten a lot easier to edit it's gotten a lot more relaxed, the conversation. I feel like uh, we sort of know what we're doing a little more than when we started. So we're going to be trying to bring you episodes more regularly. And um, just thank you, everybody, for listening and sticking with us. I hope you don't get too embarrassed. We're actually uh, three months away from being four years into doing celluloid junkies. Okay, well, that is very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, no, um, we do enjoy every moment of it. I mean, we, look, we don't do it for the listeners because we don't have any. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> but we'll see you next month. One of the things that's impressed me is that every time you've told your story, you've told it in exactly the same words. You've never varied a hair's breadth. And what does that suggest to your legal mind? Well, it suggests either that you have an extraordinary memory. Or... Or that you're telling the plain, unvarnished truth. <laughs>